Wow. I guess we could call this the TEDx uh, family. Um, my life is pretty simple. Um, <clears throat> at about six years old, I got a call to get into the uh, Chapman's Lane Choir. I believe it was the worst thing I did at night. <clears throat> but I um, was also proud to see that I think we came out of first or second that night. Um, and then by age um, nine and a half going 10, there was a man called Harold Macmillan. He also happened to be the Prime Minister of England at the time. And uh, they had him making this big speech by the mayor's office, and the mayor happened to be um, Mayor Motley's grandfather, a man called uh, E.D. Motley or Ernest Dighton Motley, or some people mm -hmm. who got close to him would call him Ruggard. And um, here was Macmillan pontificating about the greatness of England and you know how wonderful it is for Barbados to be a, a colony and all this kind of thing. And I'm saying this 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 man is a little madman, but anyhow, I um <clears throat> even at that age I was thinking along those lines. But what really hurt me is to see the children who were fainting in front of us all the time. So I walked home. I walked home and um my teacher who was a man by the name of uh Cossy Lane. <clears throat> of course you can call him Cossy, he said Mr. Lane. And um he so he asked me a couple of questions, and one of them was, please tell me that you did not walk out on the Queen's representative. And I said, sir, I cannot answer like that. I did walk out, and I got 25 lines which said, I must respect the Queen and her representatives at all times. So being who I was until today, I wrote 50 lines. <clears throat> And I learned a new word right away. It was called insubordination. <laughs> and he told me that that was insubordination. So he was giving me 100 lines because of that. And from that day, I made up my mind that I would fight colonialism in all its forms and fashions. So at 10 years old, I had already made up my mind that I was anti-colonial. And I remember stand up in front, there's a lady called Millie Cadogan who helped raise me. And I, and I said, what queen, what? We don't need no queen. And she Tony, go down on your knees and pray right now <laughs> and ask the Lord for forgiveness because you're blaspheming and so on. And I, I said, well, there's a, a little girl up in England. Are you, Tony? Oh, Lord, this house is going to be cursed. And so on, because, you know, you can't say those things. But I had made up my mind all back then. And it so happened that that was something that set me up for so many things in my life. Because I learned to play guitar as a man called uh, Mr. McLean, um, whom I, I had tried thinking that myself and my friend Carson Yearwood um, were doing well with my grandfather's guitar uh, fishing string trying to make a guitar, and then he taught us how to really tune it and play, and, and another fellow called Dean Claiborne showed me my first bar cards and stuff like that. So I began to hone these skills from very, very early, not with help from family too much, especially my mother. My mother thought I was going crazy because she was like, you have to learn a trade, a trade, and Jeffrey could teach you, which is Jeff Hoyt that has no... Um, uh, terrific tiles and some other businesses where my cousins said, no, and you know, you could learn tailoring with my, your uncle Eric, Eric Fowler, you could learn with uh, Orville and, and shoemaking, and she calling all these things. What do you want to do? I said, sing. Little boy, go from in front of me. <laughs> I didn't ask you what hobby you wanted. I asked you what you want to do in life. But None of them appealed to me. Then I tried a little plumbing, and I must tell you that the first set of plumbing that occurred in this institution with the leaking, a lot of it had to be my fault because I did not <laughs> like no plumbing. Right? The plumbing thing was definitely out. So my friend Kingsley Reese, who became one of Barbados' finest cyclists, he was the plumber, and I was the plumber apprentice. But that word was a little too strong for me. I don't think I was ever good enough to be an apprentice until today. So 
I started to get, you know, the guitar and learn this and that. And I wrote a song, a little jingle called Vote for Motley and Get Free Kiki. <laughs> because Motley was the king at the time, right? My mother and all the people in Emerton and Chapman's Lane and Lakefoot Lane and any part of the city, it was Motley, Motley. And I wrote a little song, simple like this. Vote for Motley and get free Kiki. Let me hear you. Vote for Motley and get free Kiki. Then that one. Don't mind nobody. Don't mind nobody. Vote for Motley and do what? And get free Kiki. I'm going to tell you, I had all the children in the neighborhood singing Vote for Motley and get free Kiki. The politics never hit me as so like, well, this was a man representing con con the conservative element. Didn't matter to me. Motley was a powerful man. He would stand by the door by the uh, city hall. There would be a long line. And here's a woman that is like 47th in the line. He'll, Enid, come. And Enid will pass everybody else <laughs> and go up and get her medication and her free cakey because Motley was in power, right? And, um, you know, those things stood in my mind, things like that, like, Jeez, power, power is a powerful thing, you know. And, um, you know, I began then to, to, to sing and sing. I never go to my friends. I would say, you ever heard this song? Bam, bam, ba, di, da, bam, be, do, bam, bam, ba, di, de, ba, da, ba, be, do, ba, 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 bam, bam, ba, da. You ever hear that? No. Right? I said, oh, so it means that I write it there. <laughs> and that's how I began to write. I didn't have no tape recorder. I had no nothing. My tape recorder was up here. So that's how I began to write. By the time I reached 16, I was actually really writing songs at any genre because I just believed in music. I had one opportunity to listen. It was Radio Fusion. If you had Radio Fusion, you're gone. <laughs> so I would learn songs really quickly. So I had a cousin called Bruce Batson. And two things he would do with me, tennis, real tennis, and in the singing, he would take me places and say, ah, play a song. I bet Gabby could sing that song right now. The people would play the song. Say, play it again. Play it again. Sing, Gab. And I would sing the whole song after listening three times. Right? So I realized that was something special. In school, saying they had a problem. Big problem. Because my mind used to work like that. So when I get homework and stuff, and if it was anything to do with history or religion or something, I would write it back verbatim as I read it because I would pretend that I'm an actor and I got to learn the lines. So when I learn in these lines, I learn all the lines. So I remember going up and giving him my homework, and this teacher said to me, young man, I told you to do homework, not copy from the book. I said, but I didn't copy, sir. Yes, you did. No, I didn't, sir. Go up on the boat and prove me wrong. I went up and I wrote out oh, every word. Said, you are either a trickster or a genius. <laughs> but I more think you're a trickster. <laughs> and, you know, that was it. And then I gave up. Somehow along the line, I lost the ability to, to, to go, you know, verbatim everything. I decided, look, I, get, get ordinary and do like other people. Learn it and then present it, you know, and some of it you would miss and some you wouldn't, and that's how it was. But for a long time, my t um, principal, we call him Master, that was Dighton Griffith, and I remember I wrote a site, uh, um, a thing he told me, the teacher didn't come to school, so Dighton taught the class. He was brilliant. Any teacher missing, Dighton Griffith can teach that class. I don't care if it's French, Spanish, mathematics, geography, you name it. And he happened to be lack or not, teach my class. And he told me, write of my opinion of Shakespeare. I said, Shakespeare is overrated. Oh, God. <laughs> Dayton Griffith gave me the verbal lashes of my life. Because I really felt that, I've been mean, to read all these different Shakespeare's essays. That's that, that's that. But then I realized it could be possible because just same with me. I write jazz, blues, rock, reggae, calypso, folk, and any genre because I don't look at music as a challenge. I look at music as a friend. So children look at language as a friend too. If you took a Belgian child to Russia in six months' time, it'd be speaking fluent Russian, 
you talk, uh, you take or any of us, and we be still scrambling for some adjectives or sentences or something. And that's why I look at music. I don't have it as a challenge. So if you play it, Bach or Beethoven or Tchaikovsky, I could sit down and write that back, write something in that genre, write something in the reggae genre or the folk or the calypso. Or what it, did, it does not matter to me because I don't see it as anything other than eight notes juggle. That's how I see music. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, and you repeat the do. So, hey, there's only eight things to think about. And you could do any computation, any compilation, any kind of movement up and down uh, with these eight notes. So anything is okay for me. You know, and when I wrote this song, among the other songs, um, I remember we moved, we had to move from Edmonton to Clapham. And um, I was sitting on a Sunday evening about six o'clock, and my cousin was sitting with me, and I said, Hal, Hal Batson, pass that guitar for me. And as soon as he passed, it, I went like this. You tell me to forget that my grandmother was born right there so all right, I say I shall go. And in 10 minutes, time I wrote Emerton. Thank you. Same thing with boots. I'm walking the street. Cool. Then another night, I'm with Pompey to the Mount Pilgrim. And we're by, passing by the government house. And hearing these horses go... 30 in the night, so much horses. Whoa, where are they going? When it got to me, they were not horses, they were soldiers marching. And they were preparing for Grenada. I said, wow, in Barbados? And US troops leading them? Wow. No, please. Is it necessary? To have so much soldiers in this small country, you say. No, what you say? No, no, no. And then, a little further down the song, I said, Well, don't tell me. Tell Tommy. He put them in St. Lucie. Unemployment high. And the treasury low. And he buying boots to cover soldier toe. I see them boots, boots, boots and no boots. On the feet of young, trigger happy recruits. It was boots, 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 boots and no boots. The marching, threatening army troops. Tell Tom I say that what I do. Got to see both me and you, and most of all, all the children, and stop them soldiers from marching. Hit it left, right, left, right. Government boots, government boots, left, right, left, right. Government boots, government boots. Fifteen minutes. <laughs> Music. It's my life. I don't know how I could live without it. And it's strange. I'm not a person who listens to the radio often. Because after I do that song or record that song, it is sung so many times in that studio with that man, Eddie Grant, that I don't really listen to it again. <laughs> because it, it was saying you're crazy because you, you, it's the same thing over and over and over in the studio. With Eddie Grant, you don't get away with 30 takes, you know. It's like a lot of takes, right? And then you realize people actually like this thing. You go in a party or something, you are yeah, well, you're not dancing. I ain't dancing because I like how the people are dancing. I enjoy it. I, I prefer to see you all dance than I dance. I dance if I'm up here and there's a microphone and there's a band behind me. It's different. But if I went to a party, I don't dance. Because I, I so much 
happy to see the people dancing that I, I, it don't occur to me that I should dance. If I have a song that was popular, say, it, um, during the crop over, and it's playing on Spring Garden, I go at 6 o'clock when it's almost finished. Because for me, the mere fact of thinking that the people enjoy it, that's enough for me. I don't want to have to be there and say, hi, I this, and I don't get excited about, the, about that. I get excited making the song. I get excited seeing the people react to the song um, in a more quiet setting than thousands of people just jamming like that. So you've never seen me in a, in a costume band. But I love the bands. I would stay home, watch it on TV, and say, wow, shh, look at Gwyneth. Shh, look at my friend Betty West. I, I just love it. But for me personally to be in there, it's like, what do I hear? It's like, this belongs to the people, not me. I just create the music for them to dance. That's how I feel. Um, so like, people say, when you win, how you feel excited? I remember one clip, so and so on, Gabby, how you feel, you win nine times, how you feel, man, nine times. I said, so what? Uh, you know, there's also another time, right? You try not to live on what happened before. As far as I'm concerned, I'm only as good as my last performance. I always tell myself that. Only as good as the last performance. And um, I love to be with people, and especially the ordinary people. So when I say a fisherman, I get excited. Because I'm thinking, this guy's so skillful, he has to go up there, he has to beat that water, he has to beat the tide, he has to beat the rain, he has to beat you know, big swells, small swells. He has to trick those fish into catching his bait. He has to then get back to shore. And a lot of them never even had ship to shore radio. I went out once. I will never go back out there. <laughs> I, I went out there about 4 o'clock in the morning, and by 5 o'clock, we caught a big kingfish, 37, 38 pounds. I said, wow, this is, this is great. These guys have an easy life. Yeah, that was for something. The next fish came at 2.30 something <laughs> in the afternoon, okay? And then I vomit. And then I saw a big cloud. Shh. I said, wow. I said, guys, I said, man, look at that cloud. That thing is so big. He said, Gabby, that is not a cloud. That is a wave. <laughs> wave? A wave can be that big. I mean, the whole horizon is covered with it. He said, it's going to come. Take up our little boat like a little toy. Put it down and go along about it business. <laughs> I was never so frightened in my life. That thing came, and I knew I, knew I can die, I knew it can break, I knew it thing. And the thing came up, the little toy thing that we were in, put it down, and then, and then I also saw that day, uh, um, well, a building. It was a moving building. Some people call it a big fish, because that thing was a no fish. It was huge. It was probably about seven or 800 pounds. And it went up in the air, took a dolphin with it, and come back down. And I said to myself, but if he really wanted to land in my boat, he could have. He was just giving us a break. Well, much to my regret, the fella just gave me a time check. Uh, much to my regret, but I still pay in him respect. What he didn't know, I will now sing. I have to meet Mr. Irving Berge. He tell me greet him in the Lawrence Gap. But don't interrupt. So I will now tell you all goodbye. I won't have no tears in me. I am not vexed. No, I am not vexed. I want to thank TEDx. <laughs> <laughs> 